Hi, everybody. My name is Thomas Howard. I'm one of the ICE technical marketing engineers, and we are going to be talking about a subject I think a lot of people are very interested in, um, radius simulation with ICE. So this is something that really helps you test different types of radius connections or sessions, especially when you don't have a particular device or haven't played with it before. Uh, so this is a great way to do it. And before we get started, I actually want to pull all of you and ask, what tools do you use to test radius or have you done it? And if so, what have you done it with? So I'm kind of curious, maybe I missed something that was a really good tool that I should be looking at. So uh, go ahead and Rigo just popped up the Slido thing. I'm going to put an answer in for what I use. And then I would love to hear what you're using. Rad test. Eat test, never done it. <laughs> Switches, yeah. Switches have the command line to, to test things with. Nothing, yeah. That's probably why everyone's here if you haven't tested it before. CML, never heard of that. Aruba CPM, CLI only, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just use the real device. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so love these. This is exactly what I was looking to find out is how is everybody doing this out there? So I'm gonna try and give you guys some different ways of doing this uh with with um different tools in the gui and on the command line so in order to do this uh, i really want to start by going back to the basics of radius what it is how it works down to the attribute level because if you don't understand this you're never going to understand how to simulate it right so we're going to do that show you just some different tools um, as you saw the tools that i have are not necessarily the only ones out there you can use um different command line options from, you know, switches, routers, things like that, uh, but also on Linux. And so the reason I mark this one as more of an intermediate one is because of the Linux command line stuff and kind of scripting and stuff that we're going to be doing. I'm actually going to be using my, my Linux commands from a Podman container, which is like Docker. So I could run a Linux, a Linux container and run everything there. Uh, so I'll be showing you guys that near the end. So the first thing I want to do is talk about, you know, how did we get here? Why are we even using radius in the first place? Uh, what is it for? So back in the old days, you would to connect to the Internet, you would plug your landline phone into a modem and it would slowly dial up into a, uh, a rack mounted modem uh, somewhere. And that would allow you to play games with your friends or be able to, you know, chat and things like that. Uh, but the cool kids, you know, they really like to play things like global thermonuclear war. And uh, this was a very uh, popular thing in the 1980s. If you haven't seen the movie War Games, you really owe it to yourself to see Ferris Bueller before he took his day off. Uh, this is a really great movie. Uh, it's definitely one of the one of the best ones about, you know, early internet uh, for sure. So you owe it to yourself to watch this one. So because of kids like that uh, hacking into a uh, government computers, they needed a way to authenticate users coming into networks. And so they built Radius, the remote authentication dial-in user service. So dial-in meaning like old school modem dial-up telephone. Uh, and so this was the first draft they did RFC, uh, but this was the one that finally came out, um, RFC 2865. This is really the one that we base almost everything off of. And so <clears throat> we also got with that, 2866 for radius accounting, because if we think about what we're trying to do here is we want to not only authenticate somebody, but we also need to know when was their session started, when was it stopped, and have some kind of an audit trail, not only for security purposes, uh, but those of you that are old enough to remember dial-up modems and the uh, you know 40 hours a month free plan uh, from things like AOL, this is how they tracked your billing usage is the number of minutes you used uh, with radius accounting. So uh, as the internet progressed and uh, you know the last mile uh, connectivity solutions improved, they actually extended radius to not only support modems, but the EAP protocols, the extensible authentication protocols. And this allowed us to do much better authentication protocols that allowed for uh, encrypted passwords and encrypted tunnels so that we could securely transmit our, our credentials over the wire. Uh, the other thing that happened, um, a little more recently was the ability to do radius change of authorization or dynamic authorization extensions, as it's called. Uh, so these 
RFCs, if you're interested, kind of give you like all the all the attributes I'm pulling from today are coming straight out of these RFCs. Uh, the ability to do accounting, the ability to do rate of change of authorization, everything's written up here, so you can always refer back to it. And this is really important because we get a lot of questions about network device capabilities. Does ICE support my network device? And the answer is it depends. Um, you, I just gave you all the radius RFCs. The answer is either they support it or they don't. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Uh, and then there's some other things in terms of the hardware and the software that they could support with respect to ACLs and VLANs and, uh, and security group tags and you know URL redirection. So all that's kind of above and beyond because as these access methods evolve beyond just dial-up modems, uh, we had to deal with other things like guests coming into the network, right? Uh, and you know, other types of segmentation capabilities. So all these things uh, really depend on the network device, not just ICE. ICE can do it all, but it really depends on the network device. So just be aware of that uh, when you're asking those questions or wondering if, if you can do all these cool things. So the way this works with RADIUS is you have your, your user who's going to dial up or uh, nowadays just connect to Ethernet network or connect over VPN. And then it will be authenticated via a RADIUS server like ICE. And then we usually uh, authenticate our users against a an authoritative centralized database. Um, and the way this works is we have endpoints that connect in either with 802.1x or in the case of VPN, you might have SSL or IPsec. Uh, they all, the network devices contact ICE and say, hey, I have somebody I want to authenticate. ICE goes ahead and does it. We have lots of backend databases we can connect with. And that's basically how RADIUS works to either auth to authorize you, authenticate you and then authorize you onto the network and of course account for you as well. So in a little bit more detail, the way this works with .1x is when you plug in to an ethernet network, uh, you get either a link up or you associate to your, wire your wireless. And we're gonna go ahead and build an EAP tunnel. This will secure the transfer of credentials between the endpoint and ICE. The network device is just a pass through. So when you type in your credentials, they will get packaged up <coughs> into an 802.1x frame with EAP and sent over that secure tunnel uh, where the network device will repackage it into a radius request. And what you notice here is there's all these attributes. I already mentioned attributes earlier, and this is some examples of them. So they're, it's going to basically tell the AAA server or ICE that there's all these attributes that you may want to look at in order to classify or understand how you should authenticate and authorize this user and device coming into you, uh, coming into the network. So ICE is gonna go ahead and get that. It's gonna take those EAP credentials. It's then going to verify them against the identity store. It's gonna check and see if there's a match. Hopefully there is. If so, that's fantastic. And now we can hand that back to ICE and it can go do a group lookup, match it in a policy, and then it's going to return some radius attributes back in order to do the authorization, whether it's for, again, a VLAN, ACL, URL redirect, uh, security group tag, whatever it is. So we're gonna send those attributes back and that, uh, that it, it basically enforces on that radius session for that user, for that endpoint, uh, what it can do on the network. And that's how you get you know zero trust with the principle of least privilege at the network access edge using ICE. So it will finally send an 802.1x success back to the user and it knows, hey, go grab an IP address now, come on into the network or not if it was denied access. All right, so that works great if your endpoint does 802.1x, but what if it does not? Then you have something called MAC authentication bypass. And like I said, works great if your endpoint can do 802.1x and it's configured for it, but if it is does not support it, or more than likely it does support it, but it's just not configured. And I think you guys probably know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of IoT devices out there that um, just aren't configured to do this, not because they don't support it, but probably because the people who own them and administrate them are too lazy to actually go configure it. Uh, but in that case, what we do is the device connects. We're gonna try to do 802.1x using EAP with the network device, but eventually we'll get a timeout because it doesn't respond because it doesn't understand or hasn't been configured to do 802.1x. Meanwhile, it's been ARPing, trying to get an IP address or whatever. And so the network device will go, hey, ICE, I got this MAC address ARPing out here. What do I do with it? 
And so depending upon what our policy is, ICE will go well, and, and this is the radius service type to do that. It's call check. We'll get a lot more into that a little bit later. Go, let's go ahead and accept it. Maybe we'll give it some limited access. Maybe um, based on the MAC address, I know this is one of my assets. I've seen it before. Let's go ahead and let it in, put in a specific VLAN, assign a specific SGT, and off we go. Okay. But everything here again is done with attribute value pairs uh, to uh, tell ICE what this thing is, how it's coming in, where it's coming in from, and then we authorize it appropriately as well. So uh, I keep talking about these attributes. So I wanted to give you a consolidated list of all of the attributes. So here is a list of the most popular ones, I think, that you're going to be using uh, or seeing and which RFCs they're located in in case you want to go refer to them. So uh, I also try to give you guys some examples over here because uh, this is this is exactly what it, we're going to be doing today is using a lot of these values over and over and over again. And for reference, um, I've also put these on a document called ICE Radius Network Access Attributes on the Cisco community. I don't have the URL, it's really long, but if you just search on, on this, I'm gonna bet it's gonna be in the top of any search engine because we're pretty good that way about our documents coming up and all the search engines really, really high. So if you wanna go refer to any of these attributes that you may have for any of these network devices, go take a look. Um, with that, I wanna go ahead and show you how to do a capture. Um, because I really want to show you guys how this works um, at a packet capture level. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn on our local disk management with a repository. We got a local disk repository. Um, this will allow us to store our packet captures. ICE has a built-in TCP dump packet capture tool. And if you go and you add a packet capture, you specify the node you want to capture it on, um, specify the file name. And in this case, we're going to do a, a wireless.1x and we're going to save it to the local disk repository. If you think you're going to go for a long time, you might need more than 10 megs, go ahead and do, you know, change it. You can also have multiple files. Uh, once that's done, all you got to do is come up here and see, you can see it's already running. That's excellent. So now let's go to our live logs and we're going to capture some packets. So I'm going to go fire up my iPad and log in real quick. And here I am. Okay, cool. So what we did is I did an authentication with 802.1x using wireless. I authenticated to my Active Directory in Cisco's demo cloud or dcloud. Um, I authenticated as an employee. I was permitted access. I got my IP address. Everything's good, right? Um, so that's interesting. The next thing is if you go and look in the live session, so this is actually where the accounting comes in. You can see I've started my session, okay? It has all that information. That's my live radio session. So now like, you know, the, the time is ticking. If I wanted to terminate the session, override that, you know, kick them off the network or reauthenticate them, I could do that manually right there. Uh, but I'm gonna go disassociate my iPad right now. So I'm gonna turn off the Wi-Fi. There it is. It's now terminated. So when I disassociate or disconnected from Wi-Fi, that triggered a radius accounting stop. And it doesn't show anything in the live logs, but you can see in the session it's definitely terminated. Okay. So that's basically the process. Authentication, start the accounting, stop the accounting. Okay. And now we can go to the TCP dump. Let's go ahead and stop it. Let's go grab that packet capture. So we're going to go over to our repository, our local disk repository, and we're going to download that thing. All right, I'm going to go open this thing up right there. Good. And we're going to open it in Wireshark. Hopefully you guys are uh, if, if you're geeks and you're watching this, you probably have used Wireshark. So I wanted to show you how this works. Lots of traffic in here. Don't care about like 99% of it. All I care about is my radius. So I'm just going to type in radius. And ta-da, look, only my radius request. How cool is that? Um, so if you look, you can see this is radius access request. There's a bunch of attribute value pairs. You can see Thomas, 
the IP address of my network device. Um, this identifier, the port type is wireless, service type is framed. Um, I got an ask port value of one in there. Um, just means it's the first port on there, but otherwise framed is very common. Calling station ID, that's my MAC address. Connect info, the, the network device adds that in there. We've got some unknown attributes. Let's take a look at these things. So yeah, I, those are definitely unknown. I don't know why those got stuck in there, but this is interesting, vendor specific. So you can see I'm using a Meraki access point for my wireless, and you can see they stuff some extra things in there. So you can see my, my device name, you can see if it's got some tags assigned to it. You can see you can maybe filter on tags for your authentications. You can see my called station ID has the dot corp. So that dot corp is my SSID that I could match on, right? All this good stuff you could potentially be using in your policy to match on these things. Okay. So pretty cool. That's the access request. Then there's that back and forth, all that EAP stuff going on to negotiate a secure tunnel. But eventually we get to the access accept. And it says, yeah, that guy, Thomas, um, everything is good. You can go ahead and let him in. There's a EAP success. We didn't send it back any crazy attributes. I'm just keeping this really simple, but we could send back, you know, all the other attributes for VLANs and SGTs and all other stuff. Um, and then accounting request, check this out. This is the radius accounting start. So what it does is if we scroll down right here, accounting status type start, and then you can see all these other attributes. So basically it's giving the accounting log, here's all that good stuff that we just collected about Thomas coming into the network so we can log all this, right, in our accounting message. And then we can also see there's the stop that happened a little bit later. And again, all that same information, if it needs to correlate it, it's all in there, okay? Uh, most important there will be the timestamp because that's how I wanna know when my session started and when it stopped. Okay, so the idea here is I just wanted to give you guys like, you got all the theory, right? We got all the RFCs. Now we're gonna go all the way down to the practical on Wireshark and see those raw attributes because these are the things that you can actually simulate. You can, you can create any one of these, put any values you want in there and start throwing them at ice. So um, that's what we're gonna do. Uh, we do this um, in a lot of different ways because we have a lot of different credentials for doing identity. Uh, so there's lots of different ways you may want to test this. This is a slide I've shown before. I really like it because it just gives you an idea of the many, many different ways you could try to authenticate uh, in ICE using pre-shared keys or MAB or passwords or certs or uh, even uh, multiple user and device credentials. And you do that using different EAP methods. So if you look inside of ICE, inside of our allowed protocols, you're able to create these different allowed protocol, I'll just call them profiles uh, or definitions, configurations, whatever you wanna call them. Uh, you can turn these on and off and then apply them to different authentication or I should say policy sets and authentication or authorization rules. Uh, and if you really dig down, if you open those things up, you can see there's actually a lot of options in there for each of those protocols in terms of some of the settings and things that you would allow when you want to go ahead and, and use those. So uh, just wanted to show you if you're not familiar with that or you didn't know you could turn these things off and on, this is where it comes from. I'm actually showing you the, uh, this is the, the, the defaults. This is basically what you would have when you do the, um, the default network access set of protocols that's on by default when you use ICE. So that's, that's what it looks like. And the other thing I want to mention is just because some of these protocols are there doesn't mean you should always use them. <laughs> Remember, Radius started out, you know, like 25-ish years ago. And so as a result, some of those protocols were built before the internet really needed a lot of security like it does today. And so all these protocols are considered insecure. Uh, and basically meaning that the password is unencrypted, sent in the clear, or it's very, very weak and easy to crack. So um, as a result, if you do something like FIPS compliance for like a government agency or something, um, these things would be completely disabled. They just do not want you using them at all. However, um, for doing your basic radius tests, your radius probes and playing with simulators like we're about to do, 
um, you're going to find that these are very, very common <laughs> to use PAP and CHAP. In fact, these are some of the only protocols supported in some radius simulators. So um, you may want to enable them for certain uh, tests or simulations or probes that you create um, and just allow them only on those on those uh, authentications or policies. So just be aware of that detail. But if you're doing FIPS, you can't do it at all. It's just turned off, not allowed to do it. Uh, so what I have done is I've actually pre-configured my ICE um, with this, uh, these, these policy sets really. So these are all my policy sets. And this looks a little different than what you're probably used to seeing in ICE because we have a lot of these little, uh, we call them smart conditions that go through and make your life easy. So let me see if I can, <clears throat> I'm gonna mark this up a little bit so you can see. So normally what we do is when you see wireless 802.1x, we're actually tying together these two attributes into a smart condition called wireless 802.1x. Uh, and then what I'm doing here is I'm actually matching um, on a wireless SSID. Okay, that's how we do it. Typically the access points will send their MAC address as well as their SSID that the user is associating to uh, in that radius called station ID. So the called station ID is the MAC address uh, or identifier of the, the device the user or endpoint is trying to connect to. And then in the case of corporate wired, uh, 802.1x, we're just checking to see for these two attributes. So a framed connection on an ethernet port is considered an 802.1x connection. Uh, now we're gonna do MAB wireless. So instead of a framed connection, MAB uses call check, but you'll notice it's also a wireless connection. And then we're gonna use a dot IOT. We're gonna have our MAB devices, <coughs> our IOT devices connect to an IOT SSID. And then the case of wired MAB, again, ethernet call check. Hopefully you guys are getting seeing the patterns here. Uh, and then in the case of web authentication for wireless, uh, we can do wireless web auth with a login. And typically that would be obviously for a guest network. And then on a switch, you get ethernet and again, a login. So, and then VPN is a virtual connection. So hopefully you can kind of see, whenever you see these smart conditions in ICE, really it's just making your life simple, kind of plugging these things together to simplify the look of your policy. But this is really what it's doing under the covers. So hopefully this makes sense to you all. And then of course you can choose the different uh, EAT protocols that you wanna do for .1x, you're gonna use the EAT protocols. For MAB, you only use MAB. And then for some of these others, I just chose default network access because they're gonna be, they're, they're not going to be using <clears throat> EAT necessarily, or if they are, um, it's okay if it's, if it's uh, not, encrypted because, you know, guest access or, or whatever, uh, not a big deal. So the one thing I would do want to mention is when you write your rules, just be aware that this is effectively like an access control list, the first match wins. And so you want to write the, your rules or your policy sets in such a way that you match um, on the most frequent thing at the top. Um, and then if it's something really complex, maybe you wanna try and get some other things out of the way before you really start to do some complex um, condition matching. Basically figure out a way to make it fail fast, right? So you get to where you wanna go really quickly. Um, so uh, we had Charlie do a uh, an ICE policy sets uh, webinar probably about a year ago. So if you wanna know more about how to do that, I recommend you go back and watch his webinar. So hopefully you can see um, all these different attributes um, allow you to match different conditions for different network access scenarios for your users and devices and the things you want to do. So uh, radius, the, you saw the radius service type, um, framed number six, usually is used for 802.1x, call check is used for MAB, um, something called local web authentication for, for wireless, um, could use either outbound or a login. The NAS port type, this will tell us you know, 802.11, that's wireless ethernet is, is wired ethernet and virtual is typically a VPN. And then of course I mentioned the ability to check your called station ID for the, uh, the SSID you may wanna match against to know is this my corporate network, my guest network, my IOT network or some other thing, right? Uh, the other interesting thing is uh, radius attribute number one is the username. And so maybe 
you want to check to see, you want to look at certain domains. And this is important for uh, universities and colleges if they want to participate in Eduron because you need to know uh, what domain does this user belong to because do I need to forward them off to their respective university for the authentication back there. So that can be useful. And also uh, Microsoft has this concept of a machine authentication and that is ind indicated when the username is for a computer and it begins with host backslash. That's easy to remember because you know Microsoft DOS and backslashes so uh, it's easy to remember that one. Uh, then of course you can also authenticate or uh, handle different scenarios by the EAP tunnel. So whether you're doing PEEP, EAP fast, EAP TTLS, TEEP, whatever it is, you can do that. And then, and then there's the actual authentication uh, EAP types uh, for MS CHAP or TLS or GTC. So all these different things you can use from these attributes that you're collecting from the network device to figure out what's going on. All right, so I told you about those smart conditions. So if you wonder like, yeah, I've seen these, where are these defined, Thomas? So if you go look under policies and conditions, you can look at smart conditions and you, there they are, right? I told you, I told you wireless 802.1x, wireless 802.1x, wired MAB, wireless MAB. Uh, if you open those up, ta-da, there they are. Radius NAS port type equals ethernet, radius service type equals login. So everything is defined in there. Uh, you can create your own if you wanna create your own little shortcuts to simplify the look of your policies. But at the end of the day, it's all built on these very basic radius attributes. Uh, so it's not just the incoming request, but also the authorization going back out. Um, there are lots of things you can do. You can uh, you can assign as the enforcement of that radio session. Uh, typically at Cisco, we have some things. There's the standard things, obviously, like there's actually standards for VLAN assignment, things like that. But then there's also Cisco AV pairs or Cisco attribute value pairs. And this is something that radius um, built into the original standard is this concept that vendors could extend the standard attributes with their own custom attributes. And this is basically a way that they can send their own attribute value pairs back uh, for some uh, vendor specific features and capabilities. And so these are some examples in here. Uh, and if you want to see the actual even better examples, here they are. So we'll um, you can send back radius VSAs and you can actually configure it in your ICE authorization policy. Uh, you can configure any one of these. I've done some uh, webinars with Catalyst Wireless and Meraki Wireless where I did IPSKs. So that's one I don't didn't think I, I didn't include that in here, um, but I've done that before in other webinars and you can see how those are done. <clears throat> the, other, the other one that's probably most prevalent is those URL redirections. Those are actually performed using uh, Cisco AV pairs and other vendors may, they also, some of them can do URL redirects, but it depends on the vendor and they probably have their own custom uh, vendor specific attributes for doing URL redirects because again, that wasn't baked into the radius standard. So everybody's going to do it their own separate way. But ICE has different profiles for different, different vendor devices. And so you can, we can totally support those. Again, it's just radius with attributes. Finally, before we get on to the actual simulation stuff, I'm sure you guys came here for, I just want to mention that, uh, yes, there is a minimum set of radius attributes that you have to do. Um, if you send a request to ICE and you do not send the NAS identifier or a NAS IP address, that's what ICE uses to match for your radius pre-shared key to know to authenticate it. And so that's really critical that you have that in there. Otherwise, it'll probably... Uh, it should deny you. It's going to just drop your request and not let you come in because it needs to know the identifier or the IP address, either IPv4, or IPv6 of the network device that's coming in. So that's in, in the case of doing radius simulations, this is the IP address of your, your client. So um, that's how you do it. All right, with that, let's get on to ICE session tracing tests. So this is something um, that Pavan actually uh, covered uh, in his last session when he talked about troubleshooting ICE. And I had actually forgotten all about it. <laughs> so when he showed it, I was like, oh yeah, we can totally do that. So uh, what I wanna show you is I wanna go over to my ICE box. <clears throat> 
and let's go take a look and let's look at under operations, troubleshooting, diagnostic tools, we have session trace tests. And so I went ahead, I didn't wanna make you guys watch me type all this stuff in. So I, I created a few of these. So if I wanna run a basic authenticated access test, I can come in here and run it. And we'll show you what it looks like. Um, you can set up the test, you can define it. Here are some attributes, um, really basic. We're just gonna test for Thomas doing a basic authentication. Um, we're gonna run that test. It looks like this. So it'll actually run through and actually show you what authentication policy did, what policy set did it hit, authentication policy, um, what what did it match against in terms of an ID store, and then finally was was it permitted access or not? Um, let's do something a little more interesting. Uh, if we do a probe, let's go run this guy. So in this case, I'm going to do a radius probe to show you what that looks like. This one's a little bit more involved. So I, I basically, this is just te text that you can copy and paste. Um, you got to kind of abide by its format. Um, it's very particular about like the, the specific, you can't just say wireless. You got to spell it out exactly this way. So just be aware of that if you go to play with it, maybe um, you can just, you know, go pick your attributes in here. So again, all these different attributes you can pull from, uh, you know, radius. And then you can see the different attributes that you could select. Uh, let's do called station ID. I already have I already have called station ID in here, but then you could just you know put your value in there and then say add to attribute list, and it would add it in there. Save it. Now you could reuse it in the future. That's basically how it works. But we're just going to run this, and it's going to go through. It matched on the policy I was hoping for. Um, the authentication it denied, but it still permitted me because it's just a stupid radius probe. That's how I wanted this to work. Um, so. These are some things that you can do using the session trace tool built straight into ICE. Um, is there anyone? Here's let's do a map just to show you map as well. Uh, let's run that guy and run it. So yeah, hit matched our internal endpoints and it matched. Uh, a, a, this was a specific device in a facilities group. That I was able to match and permit access. So that's cool. That's exactly what I wanted to happen. So my, you can maybe configure a bunch of these and run through some tests real quick to make sure everything's per permitting as you expect after you make some changes. So there's that one um, built into ICE. Doesn't give you a lot of details in terms of exactly how it worked. And you get, but you get to plug in those radius attributes, right? Um, and that was a session trace. So then the next thing is NT Rad Ping. So a lot of people have Windows devices. So what do we use? The only thing I've been able to find, and you know, if you guys put it in the comments, let me know if you have a better one that you run on Windows, I would love to hear it. Um, I didn't see any in the initial poll. So NTRAD ping seems to be the, the only one here. Uh, these are the two sites that I found it on. They both seem to be legit enough and my computer hasn't suffered any malware. So I think these are gonna be good. Um, looks like this. So uh, this is NTRAD ping, if you haven't seen it before. And you can you know, go through and you can fill in all these fields with the basic you know, username, password, um, and then you can add some different radius attributes. I went ahead and saved some off. So I'm just gonna load these up so you don't have to watch me type it in. Ta-da! So we're gonna do a radius test probe. Um, and I remember I have to have that NAS identifier as a minimum. And ta-da, it worked that easy. But check this out. If I use chat, that didn't work. Um, so there was a problem with it rejecting it using chat because of, um, the way the password, um, is encrypted or something when I did it. So you have to be aware of that when it depends on what, what protocol you're using. Uh, in this case, we're doing a frame Ethernet. So 802.1x and that one got rejected. Forget why that failed. Oh, right. So one other thing I want to mention is this thing is so old. I mean, it looks like Windows 3.11, right? Um, it doesn't even have wireless. You can't even choose the wireless port type. So um, it works real basic, PAP and CHAP only, no EAP protocols, um, and you can't even do wireless. So this thing is really old. Um, so yeah, 2003, right? I mean, that's really old. So 
I wouldn't necessarily recommend using this, but I just wanted to show it in case you guys were looking for like lowest common denominator tester to try. So with that, um, EAP test is one I think you guys have seen us using in some other webinars and people like, what are you using? What is that? Where did you get that thing from? So it's called EAP test. If you have a Mac, uh, you can get it either from the website of the developer or you can get it directly from the app store. I think it's like currently $8. That's when I, when I checked it. Uh, and let's go check it out. So I do run a Mac so I can run it natively here. So again, these things all work basically the same. What's the server IP address? What's the port number? What is your super secret password that you're going to use as your radius pre-shared key? And then, you know, what protocol do you want? So the nice thing about eat test is look at all these protocols, right? You got, of course you got PAP to start with, but TTLS, PEEP, all these things, wonderful. And so, uh, the other thing is uh, notice all the attributes I've added. If you want to add an attribute, you just click this and you can choose some of the, the popular ones up here for the vendors. And then you choose the different, the different attributes from those, uh, the, either the standard IETF attributes or any of those vendors that you want to use. And you can populate them in here. If you want to change them, let's say I want to change my I calling station ID, I can edit it really quick, nice and easy. And remember, we must include um, the NAS identifier, NAS IP address. So we have that in here. Um, and then in this case, we're going to do a call check. This is a MAB request. Uh, we're going to be going to a, we're going to be doing a wireless against my IoT device. You can see I got NAS port type is wireless also. So this should easily match my policy. There it is. So. Uh, very quick, I had an access accept back. And again, I haven't configured any, I just did permit access. I haven't configured anything. So we're not seeing any VLAN assignments or URL redirects or uh, ACLs, anything like that. But otherwise it would show those right here for us. And if I do a different Mac, maybe I wanna try a different one to see how it matches. No problem. Uh, it goes through real quick. And then I can also check, you know, how about my PAP radius probe? Does that one work? Yep, that works. I can just go through peep, my standard peep with you know Active Directory. Wow. Okay, so that one built a secure tunnel. <laughs> you can see all the negotiations that went flew back and forth with with uh, the building the secure tunnel. Uh, you even saw some certificates in there, right? Uh, so you can see that it's it's validating uh, certificates, making sure it's a secure tunnel, and it's trusting the certificate, and then we're we're getting in. So these are just the different ways that you can do things uh, with Eat Test. It also has the ability to do accounting. Um, you need to put the session ID in here, which should have been returned. And I don't know why it did not return the session ID in here. It should be there. Um, if you look in the packet captures, it should be there, but I don't know why it's not showing here to go plug in. I haven't played with it anymore, but if you do get the session ID, you can start it, stop it, or update it. Um, and there you go. That's deep test. So we'll go back. And on to the next one. So Radius Simulator. This is one that uh, Cisco has supplied for some of our uh, testing with like PX Grid. Um, it's mentioned in some of our documents if you dig around or search around. I put the, the link up here for you guys so you can get to it. It runs on Java. So basically it could be run on Windows, Mac, or Linux. And once you get the jar, it's very lightweight. It's like just over 100 kilobytes, not very big at all. Uh, but it provides the ability to do radius authentication, accounting starts and accounting stops. And all of these commands basically have the same options. I think you guys should be getting used to this stuff now, right? NAS IP address, radius secret, username, password, calling station ID, call station ID. <laughs> and this one actually has the accounting or audit session IDs as well. And even if you want to include an IP address and mask, you can do that. That's another option. Uh, and the way this works is uh, pretty simple. You run Java, specify the class path, which is the jar file um, that it needs to look up for to do all these operations. And then you specify the command, either radius authentication um, or radius accounting. And down here, you can actually see um, this is the command for radius authentication. And um, I try to highlight the actual values that I plug in. Uh, and the one thing to note is all of these options need to be after the, the jar file. 
specification and before the command specification. So it's very particular in the way that it does that. Uh, and then same thing for radius accounting starts and stops. You got to make sure that you have the those options in there. So pretty straightforward the way that works. Let me um, pull up this and let me um, let me do another. There we go. And in here, I should have my radius simulator jar file. There it is. Okay. So I'm going to go grab some commands. And here they are. So I'm going to grab these copy and I'm going to paste them in here for you all. Okay. So class path radius simulator. And then I just added all these different attributes just like you saw, and we're gonna do on a basic radius authentication on this one. So let's go. Ta-da, access accept, right? Uh, and then if what's interesting here is if we get back to our ICE node and we go over to our live logs, um, you can see that I just came in and is this matching MAC address 0123456? Yep, that was me, 0123456. Um, so I just came in and authenticated. And if we go look at the live sessions, check this out. Um, it shows me as authenticated, right? But now what we're gonna go do is we're gonna go back and we are going to do a accounting start. So if you actually wanna check for your sessions, let me clear this out. This is for a radius accounting start using all the same options that we showed you before. Okay, I got an accounting response, that's cool. Let's go back to ICE. And now if I refresh this, started. So before it was only authenticated as a session, now it's a started session. So the, the timer is ticking on, on the, the duration of the session. And then of course, if I want to end the session or simulate the ending of a session, a disconnected disassociation, link down, whatever you wanna call it, uh, or maybe even a, a, a session timeout or idle timeout, whatever, uh, I can go back and do this. Same thing, same command, only radius accounting stop. And I go back to my ice and I refresh. Not yet. There it is, terminated. So now that session is over and done. So that's how we were able to simulate an authentication, a radius accounting start and a radius accounting stop. Pretty cool. All right. So that's radius simulator.jar. And hopefully you can see these are scriptable. So if you did want to write a script and do like a hundred of these or, you know, read from a CSV, execute it, go on to the next one really quickly. Um, that's pretty cool. And, uh, that becomes very interesting because, as you saw, Charlie is going to be doing uh, cloud load balancers next month. And I believe uh, he's going to be using, he might be using Radius Simulator for his test. He might be using something else. We'll have to wait and see what he does. But um, this is a way that you can script these to do it at scale uh, and automate testing to see how does the load balancer spreading out your all of your different authentication requests especially when you're doing more than just one, you're doing hundreds or thousands of them, right? So it's a great way to test that with some scripting. And speaking of scripting, uh, now it's time to get into Linux. And EPL test is uh, probably the definitive or authoritative tool for doing this. Uh, it is produced by the team behind the WPA supplicant on Linux. So if you don't know, the the uh, pretty much the only Linux supplicant is a uh, WPA supplicant. So if you have a Linux box, this is the one you would install and use. Uh, and basically the same way you configure your supplicant is the same way you configure the EPL test tool, uh, which is kind of cool because if you think of all the different crazy uh, EAP methods that the Linux WPA supplicant supports, I mean, look at all those things, right? I mean, some of these things I haven't even heard of, like 
eat sake. I, I've never heard that one before, <laughs> but the, it's out there and they support it. So that's kind of cool. Um, so you can use any one of these, um, everything the WPA supplicant supports. It's basically a testing library uh, to see how these things work uh, with free radius. So um, the thing I want to mention about EPL test is this is, if you just type in, if you, we're going to show you how to, how to get all this. Um, you're going to have to build it the hard way, unfortunately. Um, is you got to run, you got to build it. And then if you run EPL test, this is the usage output you get from it. You don't have to put help or anything at the end, just EPL test and it'll spit this out. Um, these are all of the typical favorite radius attributes that we've been configuring, right? NAS IP, port, secret, client IP. They have had a couple of things in here, like how many times maybe you want to reauthenticate a bunch of times and see how fast that works. Um, maybe you want to wait a specific timeout. And maybe you want to specify your MAC address to let you do that on the command line. Uh, but where it gets really interesting is down here. So um, at first you look at it's like, what the heck is this? What does this really mean? Let me spell it out for you. This allows you to send any radius attribute on the command line like this. So uh, all these, these are like the typical ones we've been doing in all the other simulators uh, for, you know, wired wireless dot uh, one X Mab. If you notice on the right hand side, the dash in and those values, that's basically the radius attribute number, the type, whether it's a string or a decimal value, and then the actual value. So uh, if you look at radius service type framed, that's attribute number six, it's a decimal value, and framed is the is number two, and call check is number 10. Um, if you want to do NAS port type, that's attribute 61, it's a decimal value, and Ethernet is 15, wireless is 19. So you can very compactly specify this. It's a little cryptic, but, you know, that's Linux for you. Uh, you can specify these things on the command line. And the only other thing I'll mention about this is that it does require a configuration file. And this is, um, it's actually kind of cool because you can do all kinds of EAP protocol configuration details in that config file. But for MAB, when you don't need all that stuff, um, it's a pain because you still have to specify a username and a password. It's mandatory and you got it. The only way to do it is in that config file. Um, so that's a bit of a pain. I keep trying to find a workaround for that. I think I finally did figure out a way to dynamically create it using a little a script on the command line. Um, but just be aware that that's a bit of a, of a pain if you want to do this. But otherwise, um, if you want to see how to configure it, it's the exact same way that you would configure the normal WPA supplicant. It's a massive config file and lots of examples in here. And so I'm just going to pull some out. So peep MS chat V2, this is that configuration file where you specify the network, your SSID, you're going to use the peep protocol, your identity and your password. Uh, and if you want to match against any certificates, uh, and you can do multiple phase authentications, uh, if you want to do TTLS with, with PAP, for example, you can do that. This is what we're using for um, ICE talking to Azure Active Directory. So if you want to do that, this is your, your way to test it right here. Uh, TTLS with MS Chat V2, if you want that one, they do that. That's another example. And then um, even just straight up eat TLS with certificates, you can specify the path to your certs and you got to specify the, the password in there. Um, so great way to test all this stuff. Um, using WPA supplicants EPL test. So the way you get this actually, the way I found out about it is from the free radius website. Um, on their edu Roam configuration page, they talk about EPL test, how to build it and how to test it. So if you go look over there, um, they have the build instructions um, and you follow those. And I have to say it just worked um, pretty straightforward and simple. It took me about five minutes to get it going. So not actually probably half that time, really, really fast. And then to test it, you saw some, I gave you some configs already, but you can see they specify the different uh, configuration files um, on that page as well. The way that I did it is I use Podman, which is basically free open source uh, container uh, engine, basically 100% CLI compatible with Docker, but without the, uh, the licensing. So uh, I ran that, 
These are the basic commands to install it. Podman, Podman Compose, Podman Desktop. Brew is a basically a package manager installer for Mac OS. Um, but so this should work similarly for Windows or Linux with APT or whatever installer you want to use. Um, then you initialize what they call a Podman machine, which is a, a, a Linux virtual machine, because the idea here is you all this runs on Linux. And so Mac OS is not Linux. Uh, it's a form of Unix, but it's not Linux. Uh, and Windows is definitely not Linux. So uh, if you don't use WSL with Ubuntu uh, to run it or you know run a VM and do it that way, then this is another alternative for you. Uh, you start it um, to get that base Linux VM, and then it can run virtual machines or containers on top of that Linux en environment. And that's what that Podman run does, is it downloads an Ubuntu image, um, and I map. So the volume com command there is mapping my local radius simulator directory. I keep my files local and persistent on my local computer, but I can actually run them inside of that container. So that's a really cool thing to do. Uh, I named it I, I named the uh, image just RadSim for Radius Simulator. Uh, I'm using Ubuntu and I'm using the latest Ubuntu to do it. Uh, and then once it downloads this image uh, and names it RadSim, I can just invoke it and run it in real time using Podman Start AI RadSim. And this basically means run it interactively on the command line. Uh, so anyway, uh, if you care about Podman, pretty cool way to do things. When you actually build it, just follow the instructions I literally just copy and paste this whole thing into my container and out pops EPL test in like two or three minutes. So really fast and easy. So with that, let's go see how EPL test works. All right. Uh, over here, we're actually going to go. Oh, yeah, I opened up another window. OK, so you can see I did my Podman start rad sim and. Here I've got. Um, my local directory on my Mac, uh, but when I installed free radius to go build EPL test, uh, it downloaded free radius, built it, copied it over. And now if I look for where is EPL test, there it is. It's in my container um, that I'm running in as root right now. So uh, if I do that EPL test command to see the commands, there they are, like I was showing you, right? Uh, and now if I actually want to do something with it, what I do is let me get my commands and I'll start running some of these with you guys. So let's start out real basic. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to run a command for, all right, let me show you this. Uh, actually, you know, I really should have just, let me just, a lot of craziness just went on there. Let me clear this out and try it again. All right, um, EPL test config file. I've already pre-configured this. I'll show it to you here real quick. Um, very simple. My ICE server, my radius pre-shared key, go. It dumps a lot of debug texts out, right? Um, I ignore most of it. And the thing I really hate <laughs> is the last one, of course, says failure. Um, I don't know why they do this. I don't really even know it's failing, but it totally works. But it still says failure on the end. It always says failure. I don't know. I don't know why it does that. Um, so ignore that. But if you go back and look at ice in the live log, ta da, there's Thomas. Um, and the thing you'll notice is that if you do not specify your MAC address, it will always use this MAC address. So just be aware of that detail. If you want to change it, you can actually go back and, and change your MAC address. Um, so what I want to do now is I'll go back and show you. Real quick, uh, if I want to show you cat, I got all my test configs in this folder because I didn't want to clutter my main directory. Uh, but if I'm going to show you the peep Thomas one, looks like this. So I included a little example of how to run it up here. Uh, but otherwise, I'm, go so I'm pretending to associate to my corporate SSID on wireless. Uh, we're going to be using peep MS chat V2. My identity username is Thomas and the password is ice is cool. So that's how I did that. 
uh, if I want to. Get a little bit more specific. Um, what's interesting, if I actually go back here, um, notice that it hit the default policy. Okay, basic default dot one X, basic authenticated access. The reason why is um, if you go look at my authentication policy, remember how I broke everything out to show you if I'm going to do corporate wireless access, I'm expecting my network devices to send me wireless port type with a framed service type and I want to see that calling station ID is dot corp. Well, uh, when my peep profile sent it, um, I didn't, I don't have it up here, but anyway, what, what, um, what happened is I was only sending, um, the SSID and I wasn't sending any, um, any other details. And so it didn't have the framed, um, information to see, oh, this is 802.1x. And so it just when it, it did a generic dot one X, it didn't match that first profile. Now I'm going to do it. Um, I'm going to send the wireless device type and I'm going to send service type two framed without those dash in commands. Remember I showed you those. So now if I do that. Again, failure, but it's a success. Let's go look. Back on my live log. Check it out this time. Aha. So now that I added those attributes in, check it out. It matched the right policy. So the thing to remember here is um, if you're not quite getting the right match in your policy, maybe you're not, your network device isn't sending you the right attributes. And this can, this can be different between different vendors. So keep that in mind. Um, but otherwise you can see how we're able to quickly change our radius simulator to match a specific policy to get the one we want. And we know that it works. So, um, with that, I think we are just out of time. Uh, I wanted to show you some things. Obviously, I mean, there's so many more scenarios and protocols to explore, but I just wanted to give you all uh, this quick overview of some different tools uh, and some ideas on how you can do this. Uh, I'll probably need to create a document that has all these instructions and examples for you. Uh, I just didn't have time to put it all together yet. Uh, but we always have our resources out there for you. If you want to see stuff like this, more of this, if there's something specific you want, please include it in the feedback for these webinars. We'd love to hear from you all. Uh, give us some your ideas and things you want to see and uh, look forward to your feedback. So, Riga, are there any outstanding questions? Excellent presentation, Thomas. Thank you so much. Uh, I just had a look at our Q&A panel here, and I see no outstanding questions. Our uh, amazing panelists have addressed all inquiries from our uh, audience. So I think we can go ahead and wrap up. Okay.